To Furster, lone ships are easy prey. Within five days, he sinks the HMCS Alberni, HMS Loyalty, the Orminster, and Fort Yale. 14,000 tons of shipping in under a week. It's obvious we were elated. Just as the Allies cheered when one of us was wiped out. Both sides were the same. Two weeks later, Furster breaks radio silence to inform his superiors of his attacks. He uses the highly sophisticated Enigma encoding machine. The encoder uses a plugboard and rotor system to encrypt letters in millions of combinations. He sets up the rotors and plugs differently each day. At German U-boat headquarters, another Enigma machine decodes the message. The German Navy prides itself on its security. They believe it's mathematically impossible for the Allies to break the code. Furster passes the coded message to his signaler for Morse transmission. The commander reports that the new weapons have done their job, and that another secret feature is also working. The main reason that our boat remains undetected is down to the protection provided by Albrecht. But British intelligence cracks the code and intercepts Furster's message. Allied cryptographers detect an unfamiliar code name, Albrecht. Albrecht may be the secret feature allowing U-480 to operate in an area swarming with Allied warships. He was sent directly to the most dangerous spot at that time the central area of the channel, just in front of the landing ground for the Allies. So this area was only for the most clever, most experienced commanding officers at that time. And he was able not only to stay in this area, he was able to achieve a really impressive series of attacks and successes. Furster's series of attacks lie along a single convoy route to France. So how did U-480 attack her victims so effectively? The dive team heads south in their quest for clues. Today, conditions in the channel seem almost as busy as in 1944. It's not the easiest place to plan a dive. At the moment, we're steaming towards the, the, the middle area of the English Channel. Um, there are four victims of the U-480 that we want to have a look at, scan and, and see what sort of state they're in. Unfortunately for us, these four wrecks lie very much in the shipping lane. There's a, a north lane where everything runs west and a south lane where everything runs east and the Loyalty and Orminster are very much in the southern shipping lane. You can see from these green identifiers, these are all ships that are lining up to enter the Dover separation zone. As a diver, that caused me quite a lot of concern. Um, these are big ships moving at 20 to 30 knots. They appear over the horizon and disappear very quickly. Expedition historian Innes McCartney was one of the first to explore the wreckage of the Canadian Corvette Alberni a decade ago. Now, the divers will examine the physical evidence of U-480's attack to find out why the Alberni sank so quickly. But diving to the Alberni 
is dangerous. Dan Stevenson is uneasy about descending to over 230 feet in this exposed mid-channel location. It's quite an eerie feeling dropping down from light into, into the dark void, following your buddy as you go down. It's quite reassuring when he turns on his torch. When you see the wreck, it's a real relief. It's, it's so easy to miss these things and land up on the seabed and, and it's all for nothing. Here are the depth charges just lying there, inert now, but once were lethal. You can still see artifacts of the crew, like their life jackets and things like that, just lying there amongst the, the wreckage. It really brings it home to you. Shoals of fish now inhabit this wreck. She's such a pretty thing. Even the gun is just, just beautiful, sticking out where it should, in the exact position as when she sank. As we swim aft, we, we notice there's more and more destruction of the wreck. There's a definite a patch in the hull that's just completely missing. The scale of the damage explains why the Alberni sank so rapidly. Furster's intercepted reports disclose that one of U-480's secret upgrades was a smart weapon. The submarine is equipped with a torpedo designed to hone in on ships moving at high speed. As Dan Stevenson nears the stern, a vital piece of evidence is found. Significant torpedo damage to the propeller. As we swam over the prop and followed the prop shaft along, you can see that it was clearly cleaved in two. Uh, this is obviously where the torpedo struck. It looks like it hit just as the prop shaft went into the hull where the bearings would have been, where the most noise would have been generated. U-480's torpedoes delivered killer blows to its victims, but how did she get so close under the radar? In the summer of 1944, German submarine U-480 sinks four Allied ships in the English Channel. Her stealth allowed her to remain under the radar. But how? Divers search U-480's wreckage for clues. Hidden under more than a half a century of deposits is U-480's rubber coating. Still attached to the submarine's hull, a complex pattern of dimples are revealed. Could the rubber coating be the secret of success? Records indicate that Furster believes he and his crew are invisible. Allied ships set out in search of U-480. The pursuit lasted seven hours. We stayed just five meters off the seabed, nose down. Frequently, we could hear a ship hunting us. When it stopped directly overhead, we could make out every little sound. The pings from the sonar were deafening. I am convinced that the enemy couldn't detect us using ASDIC. He won't believe it. One day a destroyer passed right over us and didn't notice that we were underneath. Every depth charge is locked and we counted 92 explosions. Only one strikes near them. That one depth charge did come close, was probably a fluke. Anyway, it didn't do much damage. But to escape 92 depth charges seems more than coincidence. Something else is protecting the U-480. In 1944, the British Admiralty doesn't know what the rubber coating is used for. 
They theorize it helps protect the U-boats against depth charge attacks. But tests quickly determine the rubber is too thin to defeat high explosives. It might help the sub move faster through the water, but that's about it. Another theory is the codename Albrecht. Albrecht is the name of a character in Wagner's opera who possesses the ability to become invisible. The name bears a resemblance to U-480's ASDIC instrument, which makes the submarine invisible to sonar. ASDIC is the British code name for sonar detection. A pulse, or ping, is sent out from a loudspeaker under the ship to reflect off targets along the seabed. But the Germans come up with a way to stop the echo returning from the metal hull. It's rubber coating. Analysis reveals the innovative nature of the synthetic material. Its two sheets comprise a smooth outer and a perforated inner layer. Holes absorb the very frequencies produced by ASDIC. It, it's a, a thick rubber matting with, with bubbles, air bubbles in it. And those bubbles, if they were the right size, would, would act as, as acoustic absorbers for a particular uh, incident frequency from an ASDIC. So as the ASDIC hit the rubber, it was absorbed so that the ASDIC then didn't hit the metal part of the U-boat, and in particular, the internal structure of the U-boat, which is what gives the ASDIC returning echo. It's hard to cover a large steel hull in rubber sheeting, but the Germans find a way. Applying the Albrecht coating onto the ship's hull is a very sophisticated and detailed process. So in the first, you have to clean the complete pressure hull and the complete outer ship. Uh, this is done by blasting the ship's hull with small uh, iron bolts. After this, there is a second step when you uh, put a coverage paint on the hull and in a third step, you apply the coating onto the hull by gluing it uh, with using a special glue named chloroplane. And uh, this is very difficult because it had to uh, be fixed very slowly, otherwise it would come off easily. And any failure done during the gluing process would eventually lead to the complete failure of the system and uh, the whole gluing should be renewed as well. U-480 helmsman Horst Rörsner knows firsthand how easy it is to damage the coating. Da is folgendes gewesen, als wir auf Grund lagen, im Kanal, da ist eine gewisse Grundströmung. Und da the tidal currents in the channel would drag us slowly along the bottom. When that happened, it made a grating noise. We must have been scraping over rocks. worried that Allied warships would hear the sound. The skipper explained what was happening, and when we got to the base in Trondheim, we could see that on the bottom of the boat, big patches of rubber had ripped off. The consequences of losing the coating could be deadly. Allied warships might be able to detect the flapping sheets of rubber from miles away, rendering the cloak of invisibility useless. But Furster's luck holds, and U-480 makes the journey to Norway in one piece. On October 4, 1944, 
Furster and his crew arrive safely at the U-boat base in Trondheim.